Welcome to Washed by the Word. I'm Pastor Khan, and I wanted to personally welcome you to our Sunday morning service as we go verse by verse through God's Word. It's our desire here by Washed by the Word that the Spirit of God will speak to you intimately as we go verse by verse through His Word. So welcome again to our Sunday morning service, and I look forward to hearing from all of you sharing with us what God has shown you today as you get washed by the Word. All right, with that, let's get into 1 Kings. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapters 2 and 3. We're going to be covering 74 verses today. Can you imagine? So we're going to be here for a minute, so let's get going. Chapter 2. It says, Now the days of David drew near that he should die. David. In the first nine verses of chapter 2, we're going to see him exhorting his son, giving instruction to Solomon. David, the giant killer, the warrior, the king, the man after God's own heart, lived a full life. But now here, he's also a realist. He realizes, okay, the time is coming. It appears as we look, at, look back at what we've studied the past year, that Solomon doesn't appear to be necessarily David's first choice for this. It appears that David really had his eyes on Absalom. After all, Absalom was a warrior, good-looking man, a leader of people. It appears that this fighter leader, this man, Absalom, David was extremely, extremely fond of. And we know the story of Absalom, how he rebelled and ended up being killed by Joab and all. And now it came to Solomon, remember. While Absalom was a fighter, a warrior, we're going to see today it appears that Solomon, not so much. Solomon grew up in the palace. In fact, at this time, Solomon appears to be between the ages of 16 and 20. So he's a, he's a young guy. How old are you? Sydney, how old are you? Stand up real quick. Chris, how old are you? Stand up real quick. Solomon is somewhere in this age right here. So we got to get that in our mind. He's a young man. Now, these guys would be more like warriors, it looks like to me. Don't, so don't, don't look at Solomon like this. Solomon, you can sit down now, guys, but thanks. But that's the age range. But Solomon is a palace dweller. He's not a fighter. He's Solomon. David knows he's on his deathbed. He's a realist. My time has come. I've passed my throne to Solomon. So he has some words for Solomon. He knows, Solomon, you know, I can handle some of these guys in my throne and my leadership, but when I'm gone, it's going to be on you, and you are young, and you're not a fighter. So he's going to give him some exhortation. And that's what these first, well, actually all of chapter two is about is the throne of Solomon getting established. But first, in these first nine verses, David gives Solomon some instruction. And what he says here in verse 2, well, at the end of verse 1, so David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son. He says, I go the way of all the earth. I'm dying. Be strong, Solomon, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Man up, Solomon. Solomon, it's time to be a man. You've been a palace dweller. You've been kind of just chilling. It's time now to stand up. So he tells him, you know, be strong. Prove yourself a man. And notice, and keep the charge of the Lord your God. What does it mean to be a man from a biblical perspective? Here it is. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways. Walk in God's ways, my son, he says. And then he says to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, the four divisions of the law of Moses. He says, pay attention to the word of God. And then he summarizes, it is as written in the law of Moses. Be strong, be a man, 
Study and follow the word of God. That's what a real man does. It's not being the warrior. It's being a man of God. So David's last words to Solomon. Prove yourself a man. Be strong. Follow the word of God that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. It's interesting, we may prosper with our Western mindset. When we hear prosper, we typically think, so you'll be rich. This has absolutely nothing to do with what we have, but rather who we are. The word itself in the Greek is sakal, or sakal. And it means to have insight, to wisely understand, to act wisely. Not to be dumber than a stick, but to be wise. He says, study the word of God so you can make wise decisions. Study the word of God so you'll have understanding and insight. That you may prosper. You may have understanding and insight in all that you do and wherever you turn. That the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, David says, over in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Remember we talked about the Davidic covenant. He reminds Solomon saying, if, conditional, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And this is at the start now of 1 Kings. As we look at 1 Kings and 2 Kings, we're going to see that the descendants of David did not do this. And we're going to see, as a result of that, the throne of David Someone on the throne of David will be removed at the end of the second kings until Jesus comes on the throne. We will see the, the result of not walking with the Lord, the Babylonian captivity of the nation of Judah. Now David goes in verse 5, and 5 through 9, he gives Solomon some more instruction on what to do with some of the men that are hanging around the throne. He says, moreover, Solomon, you know also what Joab, that son of Zariah, did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel. We talked about it last week, to Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his, his waist and on his sandals that were on his feet. Therefore, Solomon, do according to your wisdom. You study the word, you walk in the word, God will give you direction on what to do, you know what to do with him, therefore do according to your wisdom, Solomon, do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. Yes, Solomon, he was my general. Yes, Solomon, he is family. Yes, Solomon, he's been at my right hand. But Solomon, do not let him die in peace. Solomon gets it. But he says, but show kindness now to the sons of Bar Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table. In other words, put them on the government pension plan. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Studies have shown that typically when the king had you sit at his table, it was more than just eating. They normally would give him a plot of ground, a home, a really good pension. A real good pension. He said, Barzillai, when I was fleeing Absalom, he gave me supplies. Here are his sons right here. Take care of them. And see, you have with you Shammai, the son of Gira, a Benjamite from Bahurim, who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. Remember, we, talk, we talked about that. He was throwing stones at David as David was leaving Jerusalem. And all. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan. I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. So David had promised, I'm not going to kill you. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, Solomon, for you're a wise man. And you know what you ought to do to him, but bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. He says, you know what should happen to him. And I think it's something in there for us parents. Notice how he's talking to his young son. He says, you've got wisdom, young man. You're a wise man. You know what to do. There comes a time when as parents we have to let go and say, God, You've got them. We've raised you up. You know the wisdom of the world will bring you grief and you know the wisdom of God will bring you joy and you will have prosperity. You will have insight. You will make right decisions if you stick to the word. Now son, go fly. Now daughter, go fly. 
We're here when you need us, but go do your thing. David on his deathbed gives these instructions to Solomon. As we look at these three folks, first we get into, well, let's go to the death of David first. Verse 10. So David rested with his fathers. He was buried in the city of David. This resting with his fathers will be a term throughout First and Second Kings for the death of a king. The period that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. Of those 40 years, seven years he reigned in Hebron, and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years. Then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggath. Remember Adonijah, the son of Haggath? Remember him? That was that third, or the fourth son of David. Remember, he was the one who said, I'm going to be the king. Remember, he exalted himself, and we saw God humble him at the end of chapter 1. Well, this is this Adonijah. And we're going to see something about Adonijah here. He comes to Bathsheba. Remember, Bathsheba says, here's the mother of Solomon. So she says, do you come peacefully, Adonijah? That's a good question, because remember, Adonijah had tried to become king, and it was Nathan and Bathsheba who stopped his attempt and got Solomon on the throne. And she goes, Adonijah, are you coming peacefully, or what's going on here? And he says, yeah, I'm coming peacefully. Moreover, I have something to say to you. She said, well, say it. And he said, you know, and I put in my Bible right there, you know, after you know, I put an arrow, like a cartoon arrow with a circle, you know how they do it, or they're saying something. And I put in there, you know, and then I put that I'm dumber than a stick. Because what he's about to say shows he is dumber than a stinking stick right here. Notice what he says. He says, you know that the kingdom was mine. Oh, man. And all Israel had set their expectations on me that I should reign. What a delusional guy. He's a smooth talker. He somehow believes if I say it, then... He says, you know it's true, Bathsheba. She goes, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, you know. No, what? Are you crazy, man? What are you doing? They set their expectations on me that I should reign. Ad 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 Adonijah, a smooth-talking manipulator. Check what he does. <laughs> However, the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brothers, my younger brothers. For it was him from the Lord. Now I ask one petition of you. Do not deny me. She says, say it. He says, please speak to King Solomon. He, he will not refuse you. You're the, you're the king's mom. I remember visiting in 1985 with a priest here in town, Father Baca, Father Paul Baca, over at Queen of Heaven. I was going up to Santa Fe with him on a burial up there. And we were in the funeral coach just driving. I was the funeral director then. It was just me and him. And I just flat out asked him. I said, I have a question for you. Yeah, what's that? He says, I said, why do you pray to Mary? I don't understand. Just help me understand. I, I really want to know. He just smiled. He says, well, if I ask you to do something, you might say no. But if I talk to your mom, she'll make certain you say yes. Are you being serious right now? Well, that's the mindset of Adonijah here. He goes to the king's mom. He says, I want something done. Will you go and talk to your son? He'll listen to you. Well, let's see if he does. He will not refuse you, that he may give me, here's his request. I want Abishag. Remember the woman they found to snuggle up to David when he was sick to keep him warm? We said back then, I said, keep this in mind, more likely than not, she became part of his concubines. I want Abishag, the Shumanite, as a wife. We say, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. Because when a king died, his successor would take the concubines. Remember Absalom? When he went into Jerusalem after David had left Jerusalem and Absalom wanted the throne, he took David's concubines and went into them publicly, his way of saying, I am the new sheriff in town, basically. That's what Adonijah is doing here. I want Abishag. It was a very fleshly, weak claim to the throne of Solomon. So Bathsheba said very well, and there's a comma there, and many people believe that when she heard that, she goes, well, there's one down. I'm, I'm going to tell my son this. And um, 
We'll see how this goes. I don't know. That's just a lot of people are saying that. But she says, very well. I will speak for you to the king. Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, and the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her and sat down on his throne and had a throne set up for the, mother's, the king's mother. She sat at his right hand. And she said, I desire one small petition of you. Was she being sarcastic when she said this, or was she just blinded? I don't know. She says, do, do not refuse me. And the king said to her, ask it, my mom, and for I will not refuse you. She says, okay, then let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, his wife. Oh, man. Adonijah, smooth-talking manipulator. Here we go. And King Solomon answered and said to his mother, now why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also? Solomon got it immediately. He is my older brother. Are you asking him the kingdom also for him and for Abiathar the priest, the member of the priest that was alongside of Adonijah last week, and Joab, remember Joab went against Solomon and he went along with Adonijah? So are you asking the kingdom for, uh, for Adonijah and Abiathar and Joab also? Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, May God do so to me and more also if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has confirmed me and set me on the throne of David my father and has established a house for me as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. So Solomon sent by the hand of Benaniah, uh, the son of Jehoiada. This is the executioner. He is going to be the head of the army. And if you're living in these days and Benaniah shows up, that's not good. Because he's coming with, with Solomon's authority. And he struck down Adonijah and he died. Solomon's throne, we're going to see, becomes established in chapter 2. And one of the things we see that he needs to do is he needs to get rid of these folks that were causing problems in the kingdom. Adonijah, number one, get rid of the smooth talking manipulator. Then it says in verse 26. And to Abiathar, the priest, the king said, Abiathar, you go to Anathoth, to your own fields, for you are deserving of death. Now, Abiathar is an interesting priest. Remember, there are two priests at this time, Zadok and Abiathar. Abiathar was a descendant all the way back to 1 Samuel. Remember the priest Eli in 1 Samuel with his sons? Remember the, the heavy dude that was sitting on his, he was sitting down when he heard that the Philistines had captured the ark of the Lord and all, and he fell over and died and everything? Remember, this was the dad, Eli, who did refuse to discipline his sons? And as a result of that, they were completely going crazy around the tabernacle and everything. And God had prophesied to him saying, your descendants will not sit on, in, you will not be uh, in the priesthood. Your line will be cut off. Here's where it gets cut off because the sole survivor now is Abiathar. Abiathar the priest, the king, to him, he said, go to Anathoth, your home, to your own fields. You are deserving of death, but I will not put you to death at this time. Because you carried the ark of the Lord before my father David, and because you were afflicted every time my father was afflicted. Abiathar, you've been very loyal to my dad, David. But at the end of his life, you chose to rebel and get involved in this attempted anarchy. You should die, but because you're a priest, I'm going to banish you. So Solomon removed Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spoke concerning the house of Eli at Shiloh. A hundred years earlier, now it's fulfilled. So Solomon's throne is getting established, and those that had gone up against him are being removed. Adonijah, removed. Abiathar, removed. Now the news came to Joab. What news? Abiathar has been banished. And Joab goes, oh man. Adonijah's dead. Abiathar has been banished. I was the third spoke of that wheel. Oh, man. For Joab had defected to Adonijah, though he had not defected to Absalom. Why is Joab freaking out? He had done all kinds of crazy things with David, remember. He had killed Abner. He had killed Amasa. Even when David had says, do not harm my son Absalom, Joab ran him through. And yet, 
Joab just seems to be a man who sinned shamelessly and did not care about whatever consequences might be threatened. That's Joab. He was never afraid of punishment. He did what he wished, and whatever happens, happens. A shameless sinner. Why? Many people point to the fact of Uriah, the hit on Uriah. Bathsheba's husband, remember. When David sent the note by Uriah, and he handed it to Joab and said, put Uriah at the front of the lines, pull back. Many people believe there's only a few people that knew about that. Joab, Nathan, and David. Hence, David had to be very careful because Joab had something on him. But David is dead now. And now here's Solomon. And Solomon's cleaning house. He's establishing his kingdom. And Joab's got a problem. He went after Adonijah. He's dead. Abiathar's banished. The news comes to Joab in verse 28. Joab had defected to Adonijah, though he had not defected to Absalom. So Joab fled to the tabernacle of the Lord. He took hold of the horns of the altar, the four horns on the ends, the corners of the altar. Joab fled there. And the scripture said, that's where you go if you're guilty of manslaughter. You go there and you hang on. It was a picture that this is where God shows mercy for our sins. So if you go there and hang on to there, you're saying, give me mercy. So Joab runs to the horns of the altar the very horns of the altar that he completely ignored all of his life. But now at the moment of catastrophe, at the moment of his death, when he knows he's in trouble, he runs to the very place of God and seeks refuge there, the same God he had ignored all of his life. Sound familiar? Joab does this, a shameless sinner. Well, he runs there and Solomon then sent Oh, and King Solomon was told, Joab has fled to the tabernacle of the Lord, and here he is by the altar. And Solomon sent Benaiah, oh man, here's Benaiah again, the son of Jehoiada, saying, go strike him down. It was a place of refuge for manslaughter, not murder. And Joab had murdered. So Benaiah went to the tabernacle of the Lord, and he said to him, thus says the king, come out, Joab. He says, no, I'll die here. So Benaiah brought back word to the king, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. The king said to him, I'll do as he said, and strike him down and bury him, that you may take away from me and from my house and my father the innocent blood which Joab had shed. So the Lord will return his blood on his head, because he struck down two men more righteous, Abner and, and uh, Amasa, and better than he, and he killed them with the sword. Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah, though my father David did not know. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his descendants forever. Here we are. But upon David and his descendants, upon his house and his throne, there shall be peace. Remember, Solomon means peace forever from the Lord. So Benani, the son of Jehoiada, went up and struck and killed Joab. He was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaniah, this executioner, the son of Jehoiada, in Joab's place over the army. And the king put Zadok, the priest, in the place of Abiathar. So now we see two, well, three of the people removed, two murdered, one banished, or one, two executed and one banished. Then the king sent and called for Shammai and said to him, build yourself a house in Jerusalem, Shammai. This is the man that cast all those insults at David, remember, in the rocks and all. Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there. Do not go out from there anywhere. For it shall be on the day you go out and cross the brook Kidron, know for certain you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. He is basically put under house arrest within Jerusalem. So you stay in Jerusalem, you're going to be fine. That is an act of grace right there because he was worthy of death. But Solomon extends grace to him. Say, you stay in Jerusalem, we're going to be good. You cross Kidron, you leave the city. The blood's on your head, my friend. Shammai said to the king, the saying is good. And as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. So Shammai dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Now it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shammai ran away to Achish, the son of Mechah, the king of Gath. And they told Shammai, saying, look, your slaves are in Gath. So Shammai arose, saddled his donkey, and went to Achish at Gath to seek his slaves. Here he is taking advantage of the grace of that was given him. He disregards Solomon's grace. Verse 41, And Solomon was told that Shammai had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had come back. 
Then the king sent and called for Shammai and said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you, saying, No for certain, that on the day you go out and travel anywhere, you shall surely die? And you said to me, The word I have heard is good. Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you? The king said moreover to Shammai, You know, as your heart acknowledges, all the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore the Lord will return your wickedness on your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded, here he is, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. Thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. How very interesting. Solomon's throne, secured at an early date, no more drama. And we're going to see Solomon's going to live up to his name. There's going to be peace in the kingdom. What did he do? He got rid of those who were causing problems or potential problems. And before we leave chapter 2, I think it can be applied to our own life. How many of us don't want peace in our life? How many of us go from drama to drama to drama to drama? How many of us are just like, I thought it was going to be a Christian, it's going to be great. Well, there are certain things we have to say no to. Listen up. We just had a history lesson. But now let's make it applicable. If you're under the age of 18, really listen up. How many here are under 18? Listen up, guys. If you're over the age of 18, listen up. How many of you are over the age of 18? Listen up, guys. This is for us right here. This is really important. If you want peace in your life, if you're tired of the drama, if you're tired of the, uh, we can follow this example. The first thing is we need to get rid of the smooth-talking manipulators in our life. Get rid of the Adonijahs in our life. Just because they're smooth talking, just because they manipulate, just because they can lie really good, that does not mean you should follow them. Follow Jesus. Not the smooth talking manipulator. How how often do we go to the smooth talker to get counsel? Because it just sounds so right. We follow their counsel and we're a mess because we refuse to follow the word of God. You want to get rid of drama in your life, you want peace in your life, get rid of the smooth-talking manipulators. Get rid of the Adonijahs in your life. Secondly, get rid of the shameless sinners in your life, the Joabs in your life. Those who sin and go what? It's okay to do this, what? Those who are willing to sin with no consequences. Those who are willing to encourage all of us to join them in their disobedience to the word of God. And we look at them and they seem to be getting by with it. So then we say, well, they're getting by with it. I guess I will too. You are in a different family. You're in a different family. Those of us us with children, you know what it's like. You go to a restaurant, you go out in public and you see some young and acting just ridiculous. Ridiculous. And you see them kicking their mom and talking back to their dad and you look at the parents and the parents just going, "Ah." and you go, what is wrong with you? They need the Board of Education applied to the seat of learning. (laughs) Let's get this going. Deal with your child. But we watch them and they they just let it go. It's crazy. But as we watch it, none of us get up there and say, let me take care of this for you. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? Because it's not our child. But if our child does that, then we say, we got to deal with this. When we become part of the family of God, When we receive Jesus Christ, it tells us in 1 John 1, 12 there that to those who receive Jesus, to them he gives the right to become a child of God. So now once you're born again, you're in the family of God. And things we used to get by with when Satan was our dad, when we were living in the world, he didn't care. He'd let us just go crazy. Stay up as late as you want. It always amazes me. Stay up as late as you want, kids. It'll be fine. And they go, they're all, be a parent. And don't ask your child if they want a spanking. We talked about that last week. I mean, what kind of, yeah, that'd be good, Dad. Let's do this thing right now. I think that's it. Do you want a spanking? The answer to that is, no, they don't want a spanking. Come on. But discipline in love your children. But when we're in the world, before we're born again, we can get by with stuff. And if we're hanging out with people whose their spiritual dad is Satan, of course they can get by with it. He don't care. He just lets them run loose. But when you become a member of the, cha- of the family of God, our Heavenly Father loves us too much to let our child do whatever they want. He says, no, you're my child, and my child won't act that way. And that's why when we try to do something that all of our unsaved friends are doing, 
and we get busted and they don't, it's like your parents are mean. Your parents aren't mean. Your parents love you. But your Heavenly Father loves you even more, loves you too much to get by with that. So he comes, steps in and says, no, 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 not my kids. I love you too much to, to act like that. Not a chance, not a chance. Joab, the shameless sinner, he's the one that says, oh, come on, what's the big deal? If you want no drama, if you want peace in your life, cut ties with shameless sinners that are around you. These would be unbelievers now. But then we look at Shammai, and here's someone who disregarded the grace that was given to him. These are believers, so to speak. These are believers who are disregarding the grace that God has given them, and they somehow feel that since I am not getting disciplined now, God's okay with it. So these are believers who choose to sin, assuming it's okay because God is busy doing something else. I have a special relationship with God. Cut ties there. If you want peace in your life, get rid of the manipulators, the smooth-talking manipulators in your life. Get rid of the shameless sinners in your life and get rid of even believers who are not living like a believer but are disregarding the grace that God has given them. If you want peace in your life, spend time with people who love Jesus and are walking with him. And you'll have no, you'll have no drama. You'll have a peace in your life. Chapter 2 of 1 Kings. Then we get into chapter 3. So now Solomon has been established. All the threats to the throne basically are gone. Solomon, this young guy, 16 to 20, is in control. God has established his throne. Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he married Pharaoh's daughter, now, for years, I taught that this was his first wife, that this was Solomon's first wife, because there it is. But if we look at 1 Kings 14.21, it tells us there that Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. And in 1 Kings 11.42, it tells us that Solomon reigned 40 years. That means Rehoboam was one year old when Solomon became king. So we look at Rehoboam's mom, and we find that Solomon and Rehoboam's mom were married and had a baby before Solomon became king. So this is not his first wife. This is his second, or who knows how many more, but this is his second recorded wife. But he goes and he marries Pharaoh's daughter, which back then, it was oftentimes done as for political reasons, for peace reasons and all. But he does something interesting. He marries this daughter. God is not condoning it. His word just records it. And he brings Pharaoh's daughter to the city of David, back to Jerusalem, until he finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. Now check this out. The people sacrificed at the high places. These are the Canaanite high places. The belief was the closer you could get to heaven, the closer you'd get to their God. So they would worship at sites all over Israel, the higher the better. Remember God said, worship me at a place that I will show you. And that's where you worship me. He has shown them as Jerusalem. The temple has not been built yet. The tabernacle is up in Gibeon. The Ark of the Covenant is in Jerusalem. And Solomon now, it says, the people sacrificed at high places. There was no house there built. So verse th 3 says, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. So, yep, he loved the Lord, but he somehow felt that I could worship the Lord at the same place that non-followers of God worship. And that's been going on ever since. I mean, we're all guilty of that. Who hasn't done that? I'm just going to go worship God at the lake this weekend. I mean, Jesus did a lot of ministry around the lake. I'm going to go to the mountains. Jesus transfigured on the mountains this weekend. I don't need to be in fellowship. I'm just going to go worship God in the mountains. I'm just going to stay home and watch it online. I don't care if God's given me a gift to share with the rest of the body. The heck with them. 
It's not about them. It's about me. I'm going to stay home and just watch it online. All you folks watching online, you're all mad at me now. <laughs> Come next week to church and tell me, okay? But at any rate, I'm just saying. But, um, you know, it's, just, it's crazy how the enemy pulls us out of fellowship. And we're dumber and sticks to go for it. I remember as a little boy, I don't, <laughs> Glenn dived, so I was, what, three? Four or something like that? I remember us going to church in a drive-in one time. Am, am I remembering that right? That's pretty nice. I thought it was really cool. I just remember being in the back with a pillow and a blanket. We put that speaker in there. It was a drive-in church. That was kind of cool. Go to drive-in church. It's nice. You don't have to talk to anybody that way. You know, you can just stay in your own car and do your drive-in church. We've advanced now. Now you can just stay home and don't have to talk to anybody. But that's not what God has called us to do. In Hebrews 10.25, it says, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. Don't do that. He tells us that. The problem is when we don't assemble, when we choose to isolate ourselves just with our, I'm just going to go away and not share my gifts with the body, we isolate ourselves and we become vulnerable to all sorts of needless pain and problems that God doesn't have for us. We choose it. Realize that everyone here has a gift or gifts that God has given them. And the purpose of those gift or gifts is to share it with the body around you. And if you're not here, how can you be used by God to minister to the body he has placed you in? I mean, we have more loyalty to that to a stinking sports team. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? You got the big game, some Super Bowl. And your, super, your team's going to the Super Bowl. Your starting quarterback says, you know, I'm going to go fishing today. I don't need you guys. I'll, I'll watch the game on TV. Say, so what's wrong with you? We need you here. Nah. That offensive tackle never blocks the guy. He's tackling all. I've been get hit all year long. I'm done. Forget it. I mean, we look at that and go, that's ridiculous. But yet we do the same thing in the body of Christ. Well, you offended me. I'm not going to play no more. I'm just going to watch it on TV. Come on now. That's not what God has for you. Do not let the enemy lie to you like that. You have no idea what can happen in our life if we would just commit to be faithful to God. Not to wash by the word, to God. To be faithful to God, to share the gifts that God has given each of us with the body that he has placed us in. Whatever that might be. Whatever that might be. I got it. So we look at this. It says they're worshiping at these high places. Verse 4, now the king went to Gibeon, where the tabernacle was, to sacrifice there. For there, that was the great high place. It was a high place, and the tabernacle was there. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. A thousand burnt offerings. In Chronicles, another account of that, it, it tells us that everybody, the whole assembly went there with Solomon. It was a big deal. It was a big ordination party type of thing. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask, what shall I give you? Can you imagine that right there? God appears to you in a dream and says, what do you want, man? Whatever you want. Can you imagine, Rick, our eyes met? God says, not me, not, not Dell. God says to you, Rick, whatever you want, what do you want, man? <gasps> Could you imagine I'm afraid some of us probably say uh, that winning lottery for that $2 billion lottery, I'm good to go. <laughs> Wrong thing to be asking for right there. But whatever you want, yeah, get this thing going. But whatever you want, just ask. Whatever you like, I'll give it to you. Solomon says, Lord, you have shown great mercy to your servant. My father David, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart, with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne. It is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I'm a little child. It's a euphemism, for I have, I have no experience. He's young. He's 20 years old. I don't know what's going on here. I do not know how to go out or to come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Anything you want, Solomon. 
He says, well, here I am. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Wow. Give your servant, notice, an understanding heart. We've talked about it before. A heart was the seat of your thought. So he said, I need to be able to think here. But the word understanding is very interesting. It literally means to hear. So literally, he's asking, give me a mind that hears you, God. I want to hear you. I don't want to hear the smooth talkers. I don't want to hear the shameless sinners. I don't want to hear those who have disregarded your grace. I don't want to hear people. I want to hear you. Give me an understanding heart. Why? To judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? Isn't it interesting? He had more concern for God's people than he did for his own personal gain. Isn't that something right there? Anything you want. And he says, I want your people to flourish, God. I want them to have justice. I want an understanding heart. I want to hear from you so I can administer justice to your people, the position you've called me. He put the needs of the people of God over his own desires. The speech pleased the Lord. The psalm had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked a long life for yourself, nor have you asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words, I have given you a wise and understanding heart. That's even more than he asked for. He asked for an understanding heart. He said, I'm going to give you a wise and understanding heart. So that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways, notice the if, if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes, my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem, he stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all of his servants. Now we see an example of this unbelievable wisdom that God had given Solomon. Now two women who were harlots came to the king, stood before him. One woman said, oh my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house and I gave birth while she was in the house. It happened three days after that, a given birth. This woman also gave birth. They had two little babies in the house. We were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house and our babies, of course. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night, took my son from my side while I was sleeping and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was dead. But when I examined him in the morning, indeed, he wasn't my son who I had born. Then the other woman said, no, 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 no. The living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman says, no, the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. You can see a dilemma here. Thus they spoke before the king. So the king is presented with an issue. It is now time for him to give justice, verdict, counsel, if you will. And the king said, the one says, this is my son, and your son is the dead one, and the other says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Man, what to do? You ever been in that situation? Someone comes to you for some advice or something, you go, man, I hear both sides of the story. What do you do? It's like, he does something really wise. The king says, bring me a sword. It's always wise to ask for the sword when confronted with any kind of counseling advice given situation. We remember in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, it talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We remember in Hebrews 4, 12, it says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Bring the Word of God into the equation all the time. When people come to you for advice, as much as we like to rest on our laurels and how smart we are, we've got nothing to give apart from the Word of God. When someone comes to you for advice, Swallow our pride and say, this is what the word of God says. That's who you want to listen to. This is what the word of God says. That's what we listen to. 
Well, the king has got this wisdom, this understanding heart now. He says, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. And can you imagine when the king says, divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other? Can you imagine if you're in the court of Solomon? And that's, that's your man. That's the king. And he says, well, just bring a sword. Let's cut the baby in two and split it. You're going, oh, man, we got ourselves a loser here. What kind of king is this? What kind of advice is this? Have you ever been there where you go to counsel, someone opens up the word of God and they say something, or in your quiet times, and you read the word of God, you say, well, that, oh, man, that's not going to work. But we're going to see the wisdom in this. Because you see, the wisdom of God is much bigger than our immediate need. God has a big picture involved. We like to respond to the immediate. But notice, divide the, the baby in two. And the woman whose son was living, the real mom, spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. She says, oh, my Lord, give her the living child. Don't kill the baby. Ah, mother's heart was exposed. The other one says, no. Go ahead and cut them in two. Each get half a baby. That's fair. Guess who the mom is? Hello. 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 It is amazing. My Lord, give her the living child. By no means kill him. She understood that if you divide that baby, it'll lead to death. Do you know the same is true in a marriage? A marriage divided will end up in death? Do you realize that a, a fellowship divided will end up in death? Do you realize that when we are divided with our relationship with the Lord, it ends up in death? Do you remember what death means, Thanatos? Separation. Not cessation, separation. Division will separate us. But on the other, but the other said, let him be neither mine nor yours, divide him. So the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him, she's the mom. And all Israel heard the judgment which the king had rendered and they feared the king for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. They go, wow, this king is awesome. He might be 20, but God is in him. God is in him. God is in him. Chapters 3, 2 and 3 of 1 Kings. Solomon is now on the throne. All the problem child, children, if you will, have been removed. And it becomes an administration of Solomon. His name means peace, and he will have peace. He will have an unbelievably great administration as long as he keeps following the Lord. A lesson for us. You want a peaceful life? Follow the Lord. Man up. Follow God. Be strong. Get rid of the smooth talkers. Get rid of the shameless sinners. Get rid of those who disregard the grace of God. Stand tall. Don't compromise in worship. Be someone who's committed to worshiping Christ. Be someone who is committed to publicly showing up. Do not use anything as an excuse not to gather together to publicly proclaim that Jesus is Lord and to minister one to another. An early morning service is so much more than just singing some songs and listening to a Bible study. When this service ends, now the body comes together and there's fellowship. This is where we pray with one another. This is where we love on each other. This is where we're going to offend each other. This is where we have an opportunity to ask for forgiveness for offending one another. This is where it happens. This is part of an early morning, Sunday morning service. We come together and we rub shoulders and we minister the love of Jesus one with another. There will be visitors here, guests here, maybe some unbelievers here. Reach out to them. There are some that are hurting really strongly right now. Don't ask those that are hurting how you doing. They're hurting. But you can give them a hug and just tell them we love you. We love you. I think it was two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, Juanito, Keith, and I were trying to convince Michael to get his earring in his ear, his ear pierced. <laughs> That's one of my best memories of Keith because he was really into it, man. Keith got all fired up on that. And um, share a memory that you have of Keith.
with Michael and Juanita. A couple of you came up to me and said, man, last week Keith was talking to me like he's never talked to me. He was just talking. A lot. We'll share that with them. We want to love, encourage, and let God use us to come around them and just love them. Give a hug. Show some love. It's our opportunity to be used. So, tonight, are you teaching tonight? Pastor Anthony's teaching tonight. Where are you, chapter what, 13? I don't know either, something like that. 14, chapter 14, okay. <laughs> chapter 14 of Luke, come join us tonight. Pastor Anthony's gonna feed us some good food tonight. Come enjoy, come enjoy. Luke 14, that'll be tonight at 6.30. Oh yeah, okay, on server. Yeah, it'll be good. Okay, so come on in and join us. Have a sweet night of fellowship tonight. God bless you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for time just to walk through your word. God, we ask that you would uh, bless us as we go. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. God, we ask that your spirit would wash through us right now, Lord, those that are hurting here, those that have been offended, those that are, have offended. God, whatever it might be, God, we just pray that your spirit would come and just wash away the nonsense. Lord, that your love would reign supreme in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.